Buonasera, benvenuti a tutti. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our first appointment of Dante Settecento, our new series of events celebrating Dante Alighieri on the 700th anniversary of his death. My name is Tiziana Cervesato and I'm the director of events uh, at the Italian Cultural Center. I am really happy to embark with you all on this new adventure and specifically today, March 25th. Since 2020, March 25th is the official annual day honoring Dante Alighieri with many initiatives around the world. And we at the ICC uh, are delighted to offer uh, the series Dante Settecento to our audience in Minnesota to remember the life and works uh, of Dante as well as to reflect on the immense influence uh, that Dante had on today's society. For our introductory talk tonight, I'm very happy to welcome back our speaker, um, Professor Pieranna Garavaso. Uh, she's Professor Emerita of Philosophy and has taught for 34 years at the University of Minnesota in Morris. Uh, Professor Garavaso is now devoting a lot of time to reading and discussing Italian literature. Before I give the word to Professor Garavaso, a quick reminder uh, to keep yourselves muted during the presentation. Uh, also to remind you that you can choose uh, among various uh, speaker views options uh, by clicking on the view button on the right top corner of your screen. Uh, the presentation will last about 45 minutes and then at the end there will be a 15 minute um, uh, for Q&A. And but from the beginning, feel free to uh, type your questions directly in the chat. And also for your information, uh, this presentation is being recorded. So now without further ado, uh, I welcome Professor Caravaso. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Tiziana, as usual, your kind words. I'm very happy to be back here talking about the master of Italian literature. Um, today, is, uh, Tiziana has mentioned, is Dante D. And it's actually the first one that we are able to celebrate because the, uh, the Ministry of Culture uh, decided that the 25th of March was going to be Dante D, which is like, you know, we say lunedì, martedì, mercoledì. And so Dante D is the day for Dante. But last year, um, at least I was in Italy, and the 9th of March, everything closed down. It was locked down because of the pandemic. So I doubt that we had uh, any celebration. This year, there are still many areas are still in lockdown, but I think there have been a lot of initiatives. So I'm very happy to be here celebrating it with you. Um, toward the end of my talk, I will talk about the controversy having to do with Dante D. There was an article on a German newspaper I believe it was a newspaper, not a magazine, that raised some issues about Dante. So we'll come back to it. But even Pope Francis in this day has been commenting on the importance of Dante for Italian culture. As an Italian, I grew up thinking of Dante a lot, not just because I'm an Italian and we study his work at the, at the school, the public schools, but also because I grew up in Verona and Verona was a very important city for Dante. I think he spent probably half of his uh, exiled years in uh, Italy. And so we had continual, we had a lot of uh, reminders of his presence. I will now proceed to show you some of my um, slides. Let's see, there. And I want to start with this painting. So um, in theory, this is one of the meetings, one of the encounters that Dante had with Beatrice. It's clearly a painting that was done much, much later, maybe in 1800, 1900. It's ambiguous right now because 
or at least to me. Um, it's not clear if Beatrice is the woman in white or the woman in pink. In most of the paintings that you will find on the, on the web, Beatrice is wearing a white dress. And so I'm, I, mean, I think that she might be that character. Um, Dante is often, uh, if not always, is wearing a red uh, dress. And uh, as you will notice here, he doesn't have yet his laurel crown of, um, of um, um, laurel on his head because when they met, he was still very young. Dante was born in 1265 and he did come from a noble family, not a very um, powerful family, but middle nobility. And uh, his father was Aldighiero II degli Aldighieri. His mother was Donna Bella, um, and she was from unknown uh, lineage. Um, she unfortunately died when Dante was very young, and so he lived without his mother. His father um, commit, uh, arranged Dante's marriage in 1277. So Dante at that time was 12. His uh, important and first meeting with Beatrice was supposedly when he was nine years old, and so was she. Um, they were both uh, born in the same year. And interestingly enough, his wife too, Gemma Donati, was born in 1265. Um, unfortunately, he, he met with Beatrice twice in his life. Once when she was nine, uh, and, and he was nine too, and when they were both 18. And so there is a lot of speculation, right, on how important could this person have been for him, given that they really uh, did not have much uh, um, way of knowing each other or talking with each other. Some of the commentators to all these paintings you find on Dante point on the, on the meeting with Beatrice and mention the fact that she is always surrounded by women because of course at that time she couldn't be just traveling on her own. Um, um, you might be curious and we can come back to this, but why is he always dressed in red? I did a little bit of research and it turned out that it was not so much that he was dressed in red, but that the painter um, represented Dante dressed in red because that was a sign of being of a noble family. Um, uh, colored fabrics were expensive in the Middle Ages and the red one was one of the most expensive. So by dressing him in red, the painter would represent his state of wealth. Um, also, we will um, spend a little minute about the laurel symbols. As you can see, I gave you, I wanted you to have two different images. In the literature, uh, in the visual art, uh, Dante is often represented as it is on the statue on the high uh, right. Uh, the statue on the left, uh, bottom is the statue actually of Dante in Verona. And we'll come back to it. And as you can see, he's thoughtful, is meditating, but he doesn't have the laurel. The laurel on the top is the one that if you were ever in Italy in February or June or September, you might have run into many young people wearing that crown of laurel, which is what we still wear when we complete our BA or BA, um, BS, a bachelor degree. To celebrate the completion of la the laurea, we are given this crown. And in my family, we did use that, those bay leaves. They were good for broths and cooking. Okay, this is... Uh, um, a reminder of the second part of uh, 
Dante's life. He started being active politically in his country um, after um, Beatrice's death that was in 1290. She uh, we'll talk a little more about her, but she died quite young. And he was involved in some military campaign. But what was most important was his political um, activities. He was elected priore, which was one of the highest charges in the city. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, Florence. Florence was a republic at the time in which Dante uh, lived. And then, uh, very interestingly, in 1302, he was actually sent to Rome to convince uh, the Pope, who was Bonifacio Tallo, Boniface VIII, to help to um, quiet or create peace in Florence, and we'll see why there wasn't a lot of peace. But unfortunately, when he was gone, there was a change of political power in Florence. And so um, he was accused of barratry, uh, of having uh, obtained uh, money for uh, favors. And what happened was that he was never able to go back and he was condemned in absentia. Um, so uh, while he wasn't able to go back to Florence and uh, he was condemned to exile, but um, also to very severe punishment if he were found on the territory of the Republic and the punishment was to be burned alive. So Dante, from then on, was never able to go back to Florence. I had a, a brief hope that he would do so when um, an emperor, Arrigo uh, VII, uh, was supposed to come down to Italy and maybe rearrange some of the uh, country's um, kingdoms and power, but he uh, actually uh, Rigo died prematurely, and so Dante was never able to go back. Apparently, he pleaded and tried to ask for forgiveness, but then they told him that he had to do a public apology, and uh, he refused to, and so he was never able to come back. You're shown the pedestal of that statue here because in my own town, Verona, they devoted a, a statue and a square to him. And here it just says Dante, lo primo suo rifugio. So his first shelter that was in Verona. This is a picture of Beatrice. As you can see, she was born same year as Dante and died quite young. She was probably not yet 25. She was again uh, um, promised in marriage to a, noble, a, man, a member of the aristocracy in Florence, whose name was Simone dei Bardi. And apparently she died, this is not certain, but she died in childbirth. I wanted to give you also a, a reminder, uh, since we will talk so much about Beatrice in this talk, and if you come to the one on the Divine Comedy as well, um, actually um, Dante did marry a woman, her name was Gemma Donati. He married her when he was 30, so it wasn't that young. He married her in 1230, and she uh, was named Gemma Donati. Now here you see the front of a book devoted to Gemma Donati. Actually, there isn't much written on Gemma Donati. This book is 1997, but uh, there is now emerging a little bit of interest in her. Uh, some historians found out that she tried to get back the properties of the Alighieri family for her children, because actually she had for sure three children 
possibly four. So Dante, um, although uh, didn't live in, uh, in uh, Florence anymore, either she visited him or she was able to have the oldest children before he was exiled. The reminder of Natalia Ginsburg book is because when I was reading that book, La Città e la Casa, there is a very interesting character in this book. There is a woman, a wealthy woman, that struggles all her life to try to put up a, um, to put on, sorry, a, a theatrical uh, event in which there will be Gemma Donati in a monologue talking about the feeling of a woman that has been in many ways betrayed. And so I thought it was interesting, this quite recent interest toward uh, Gemma Donati. This is a portrait of, again, Beatrice when she was young. Notice that all these paintings, her paintings, they are done in the 1700s, this was um, painted in 1819, and the author was Alston. Okay, uh, I told you that she died very young. This is uh, her tomb. And the uh, writing says, under this altar, Folco Portinari was the father of Be Beatrice, who was called Bice, actually. Um, he built the tomb of the family, and this was in 1291. So, and, and here was buried Beatrice Portinari. So you can see that the tomb was built after her death. Um, I thought that it might make sense for you to understand Dante's uh, life and poetry to talk a little bit about what Italy was at the time in which Dante was living. And it's very, this map is useful to me because it can show you how Italy was divided in very many different political powers. And um, for those of you who came to, to the Circolo Letterario, um, I have talked about the fact that the unity of Italy is pretty recent. Um, this, so it may seem, uh, you know, that this is a very long time ago, but you have to think that all this division um, actually continued for a long time until the 1800s. Um, the main reasons for this division was, of course, the end of the Roman Empire in 476 allowed or determined a lot of invasion and migrations. There were the Vandals who came, there were the Ostrogoths, the Longobards who <laughs> invaded a good part of Italy, the Longobard then stayed in the northern part where there is now Milan and Lombardy. Um, but because of all this division, uh, the, the country was pretty much divided between small little um, republics like the maritime republics like Genoa, Venice, Venezia, and Lucca. And Florence was not a maritime republic, but was an independent republic. And then there were some kingdoms or duchies. Um, and often the um, rulers in these kingdoms of duchies were named either by emperors or by popes. And that was the reason the matter of contention between popes and emperors. It was called la lotta delle investiture. So who should name the successor? And there was a big battle between emperors and popes. You can see the yellow area is the yellow where the um, pope was actually the um, political um, power. And uh, you can see how Florence was so close to the um, 
terrain, to the territory uh, dominated by the Pope. So there is no wonder that in Florence, it grew this uh, enmity between Guelfi and Ghibellini. And I will talk a little bit about that. So who were the Guelfi and the Ghibellini? Well, uh, the Guelfi in, were on the side a way of simplistically characterize them is to say that the Guelfi were on the side of the Pope and the Ghibellini were on the side of the Emperor. But actually, if you look at their origin and the origin of the words, they were origin, uh, the origin is imperial, it has to do with um, uh, lay political power, not, um, not uh, religious. So the Guelph were the supporters of the Bavarian house, and they were called like that because Guelph was one of the ancestors of the Bavarian emperors. And the Ghibellini were called Ghibellini because from a castle that was in the power owned by Conrad um, the third. The Conrad was part of the Hohenstaufen house or the house of Swabia, Gisdevi, we say in Italy. So in France, in, sorry, in Florence, we have this um, fight between the supporter of the Pope and the supporter of the Emperor. But when the supporter of the Pope, and that maybe is understandable given the closeness of the uh, the political influence of the Pope, the Guelph uh, prevail. And so inside the Guelph side, we have the creation of a new uh, division between what are called the white wells and the black wells. And um, I, I will talk a little more about that. I, I thought you would enjoy because I saw, I know that some of you prob probably visit Italy to see these two towers because on the uh, finishing of the two towers, you could um, distinguish the uh, cities or the castles that were favoring the emperor like the ones on the left, the Ghibellini. And on the right, you can see the finishing of the towers where there were wells or people who supported the, uh, the Pope. Um, the wealth divided, as I said, between the blacks and the white. Dante was a white wealth. And uh, there was a lot of uh, battle in, uh, in Florence, a lot of turmoil because of the fights between these two different groups and in particular, the family that were connected with the two groups. So the Donati family was actually connected culinary with the black and the, the Cherki family was connected with the white. When, um, when Dante became a, pri a priore, a prior, he actually tried to be impartial. And in order to try to bring back some peace to um, Florence, they decreed that the heads of the blacks and the white parties had to be banned from the cities. And this led to the banning of his best friend, of whom we will talk a little bit um, in, a, in a while, who was Guido Cavalcanti. So Dante was trying to be impartial, even uh, banning his best friend. I thought you may like to see this map too, because this in the orange, you can see how extended was the power of Florence, the Republic of Florence, <clears throat> sorry, when uh, Dante was leaving. But then the following century, you have the kind of master color, and then the more yellow, the brighter yellow is the power of the Republic. Uh, going to 1430. And I thought you may enjoy because you can see the names of some of the 
where many, many Americans go to visit in Tuscany. Uh, there is Cortona, that is the most beautiful museum <coughs> of Beato Angelico. There is San Gimignano in the picture. There is Volterra, which is very important for the marbles and for um, uh, Etruscan. And so I thought it's, it's pretty impressive how the influence of um, uh, the Republic extended. Sorry. <coughs> <clears throat> now, <clears throat> what were the important intellectual influences on Dante? I mentioned Guido Cavalcanti. He was a poet, and he was the one who was banned by um, Dante. He really loved his friend. He wrote um, a lot of poems that had a topic of love, which was the main topic of the movement uh, in this period of poetry in Italy that was called Dolce Stil Novo, and which is quite responsible and important as a face in the development of the Italian language. And we will get to talk a little more about that. <clears throat> Brunetto Latini is almost considered a philosopher because his Tesoretto was uh, written in French, and I don't even try to pronounce the title because unlike Tiziana, I never studied French, but Il Tesoretto contains a lot of ethical and moral uh, teaching and allegories. And in um, Dante's work, the allegories, the simile were very, very important. And so Brunetto Latini had great influence on him. I mentioned already that he had a good education because he was from a noble family. And I think it was important also that at the time in which Dante was living, the Republic was giving more and more uh, power and attention to the class of merchants. And so the bourgeoisie was emerging. And so not only the noble families would have been doing intellectual work. And that must necessarily have affected his, um, his growing. So Dante is often uh, mentioned in Italy, and certainly it is, his work is taught as being the father of the Italian language. And I want to spend just a little bit of time on it. You're members of it, the Italian Cultural Center, so I assume you are interested in the development of the language too. In um, the, the Italian language that we use now came out is, is the um, uh, offspring, let's say, of what we call volgare. And volgare comes out of Latin, of course. Uh, but it was influenced by what is called the Provencal school or the school of poetry that was dominant in France in that period. There was also a similar, a similar school of poets in Sicily, you have seen how big the Regno di Sicilia and Sardinia was. And so there, there was a lot of support for the arts with the, these different kings. And as I mentioned, in Dolce Stil Novo was certainly very important in the development of uh, Dante's production of poetry and fundamental in the development of the language. Dolce Stil Nuovo, of course, means um, sweet new style. The topic of this poetry was mostly uh, love, the love for some special woman that is presented as a positive force in the life of the man. And um, in France, there were the troubadours. So the musicality of the language, the music of the language was very, very important. Um, this is a precursor of, of uh, Dante's poetry. When 
in Italy, when you study language, and I'm sure those of you who went to school in Italy, hopefully tell me that you uh, remember this too. I remember very well, this might have been my first year of what you call high school or gymnasio. And when you st study the development of the Italian language, you read this cantico. It was written by Francis of Assisi, the same one that is also called St. Francis. And although I cannot read it all for you and translate it because it would take us too long, I do want to point out to you some words here and there that will give you a sense of why this is a considered like a tra transitional step between Latin and Italian. First of all, you see some of the words are having an ending with a U. Now, while the fourth declension in uh, Latin does have U ending, really there are many words in Italian that end with U and not every um, adjective or many adjectives like here. And um, only Sardinian language actually maintains the dialect, maintains a lot of the U. You can see some words that were Latin, like ad, et, uh, cum, all words that are not used in Italian, but they were used in Latin. And also one of the, uh, to me, very uh, special um, parts of this poem is the naming of the sun as frate sole and the naming of the moon as sora luna. Uh, this remain in the popular culture, I would say, even if this poem, as you can imagine, was written almost a millennium ago. So what were the important works that uh, Dante wrote? He wrote both in Latin and in Vulgare or in Italian. And you see on the left, the Vulgare Eloquentia, Monarchia, Questio de Aqua Terra. I think it's very interesting uh, uh, that the topic of the question, the aqua terra, uh, is the thesis that water can never be above um, the earth. So according to his uh, geological theory, let's say, uh, for Dante, aqua always had to be at a deeper level than uh, the earth. Monarchia was a political work, of course. I'll spend just a little bit of time on the Volgari Eloquentia before starting to talk about the works that Dante wrote in Volgare. As you can see, La Divina Commedia was almost all written while he was in exile. And that explains a lot of his content. So the Vulgari Eloquentia was um, a work that was not finished. Um, uh, he was planning, Dante was planning four uh, books, but he wasn't able to uh, complete the work. The first book is completed, the second is not. And the main reason why I wanted to talk about it is because um, when I was preparing for this conversation, I discovered that I had uh, forgotten probably this and that I had a mistaken idea. My mistaken idea was that the Italian developed from the Tuscan dialect because Dante was from Tuscany, he spoke the Italian, um, the Tuscan dialect, and so that's what became uh, Italian. And that <clears throat> that's certainly not what happened, and it was certainly not what Dante wanted to happen. He wanted the language of Italy, of a unified Italy, to be a what he called Il Volgare Illustre. So what is Il Volgare Illustre? In this work, <clears throat> Dante criticizes all the dialects of Italy and for their, not, for their limits and for their lack of musicality, including the Tuscan dialect. What he thought needed to become the 
the language of a country uh, was supposed to be the language used by the poet and the writers of that country. And so that makes, you know, in a sense, makes total sense of why he wrote La Commedia in uh, Italian, because he wanted to contribute to this process of creating a new language. La Vita Nova, Nuova is, as I mentioned before, the story of his love story. It's autobiographical. It's about Beatrice. It's about his first encounter with Beatrice, his second encounter nine years later. As you can see, there are more paintings of these encounters. Um, it's interesting he, that he wrote all the poems while Beatrice was alive, so before uh, 1290. But then all the prose that is interspersed with the poem um, are, were written later after her death. Um, he follows the Provencal, the troubadours model of presenting um, Beatrice as a Donna Angelicata, so a, a woman angel. Um, she is the force that is going to bring every heart and every man to sublime thinking and behavior. Um, the last a comment that, well, I want to make two comments on the painting. You can see that in the first one, he is very young and so is Beatrice. So I think this painter wanted to represent their first encounter when they were nine years old. And notice that Dante has no laurel around his head. The second one is a more, I don't know, abstract in a sense. Uh, painting is also a much later one. I liked it because there are other figures um, behind Beatrice. And, um, and this allows me, in a sense, to introduce the reason for the Donne dello Schermo. Le Donne dello Schermo, or the screen women, were women that... Um, <clears throat> that Dante would name in his poems to protect, to screen Beatrice. So he would pretend that his love song was for this different woman. It was truly for Beatrice, but he used another woman's name to protect her reputation. He tells in the Vita Nuova that Beatrice quit saying hi to him although as we know they didn't meet many times because of the rumors um, and because her reputation needed to be protected. And so I imagine that those two angelical figures on the right might be the two gossipers who are responsible for ruining Beatrice's uh, uh, reputation. We will come back to the Don and Dello Schermo very soon. Um, I have chosen to give you an example of the poetry that Dante was writing, the beginning of three poems, and I'm going to check with um, um, Tiziana if I, I can actually read them. How are we doing with time? It's 6.39, so I think you can, you can go ahead and read it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, let me go back to the poems. I chose these poems because I think they, they give you a very good sense of the Donna Angelicata. So I read each of, of them and then I'll translate. By the way, I was lucky enough to find translation by the poet, um, uh, the poet Dante Gabriele Rossetti, a British poem, who was named after Dante by his father, the first one. Donne che avete intelletto d'amore, io ho con voi della mia donna a dire, non perché io creda sua laude, laude finire, ma ragionar per sfogar la mente. So he says, ladies, they have intelligence of love. 
of my own lady, I would speak with you. Not that I hope to count her praises through, but tell you what I may to ease my mind. Negli occhi porta la mia donna amore, perché si fa gentil ciò che la mira, ove la passa ogni om ver lei si gira, e cui saluta fa tremarlo core. My lady carries love with her eyes. All that she looks on is made pleasanter. Upon her path, men turn to gaze at her. He whom she greeteth feels his heart to rise. Tanto gentile e tanto onesta pare la donna mia quando ella altrui saluta. Con ogni lingua deve tremando muta e gli occhi no la riscon di guardare. My lady looks so gentle and so poor, pure when yielding salutation by the way that the tongue trembles and has no to say and the eyes which fain would see may not endure. So I hope this gave you an idea how women who are loved in this poetry are presented as agent of change. So the Divine Comedy was not called divine by Dante. He wasn't this arrogant. It was Boccaccio, actually, another important uh, Italian writer of the Decameron, who called his Commedia Divina. Dante calls his work Commedia twice, in his own work, one time with two ends and one time with one. And if you wonder why, because comedy for us is a farce. At that time, comedy was not so much a farce, but a work that had a good ending. And of course, La Commedia had a good ending because it was from Inferno Purgatorio to Paradiso. Um, it's a journey, a journey with the help of a pagan poet that was Virgil, um, has a very particular rhyme. All of this topic that I put here for you are the topics that are important to understand in reading the Divine Comedy. And since I'm planning to give another talk, just focused on the Divine Comedy, I hope you will consider to join us. Uh, for that event. We will also have a sort of a book club event for the third one in which um, we will distribute, or at least I think we'll be able to distribute uh, because it's in the public domain, the um, um, text, the Italian text with the English text. Uh, right by side by side, and then we will be able to discuss uh, your impression and your question of that. Um, I mentioned the Canzoniere as another work, but very briefly, because um, I just, the only reason why I mention it is because it's, um, I want to read and to talk about a poem, poem taken from the canzoniere. This is a poem devoted to Guido Cavalcanti, that same important poem, poet and friend of uh, Dante, uh, whom Dante banned from Florence. Um, I think the poem is very beautiful. I remember it from studying in, in high school. And uh, I will make some comments about it after I read it in Italian and in English. Guido, I vorrei che tu e l'Apo ed io fossimo presi per incantamento e messi, e messi in un vasel, che ad ogni vento per mare andasse, al voler vostro e mio. Sì che fortuna o d'altro tempo rio non ci potesse dare impedimento, anzi vivendo sempre in un talento di stare insieme crescesse il disio. E monna vanna e monna lagia poi con quella che è sul numero delle trenta con noi ponesse il buono incantatore e qui vi ragionar sempre d'amore e ciascuna di lor fosse contenta 
sì come il credo che saremmo noi. Guido, I wish the lapo you and I, by some enchantment, could be bound, set aboard a ship with all winds found to sail the seas as you might wish, as I or I. So no misfortune or worsening weather might prove for us the least impediment, but we'd live there in mutual assent, desiring close companionship forever. And Mona Vanna, Mona Lodge too, with she who is also number in the 30, placed there thanks to the good enchanter and there we talk about love forever. And each of them would be truly happy as Lapo would, I think, and I and you. So why do I want to comment on this uh, poem? First of all, it's musically beautiful. But I think uh, shows the human side of uh, Dante. He was a young man. And as probably all young men, he wanted to spend time with his friends. He wanted to spend time with Guido and Lapo, and he wanted to go on a boating outing. And of course, they wanted their girlfriends close to them, and they wanted the weather to be perfect and no storm. Um, but I want to point out something that not as enduring. So, he doesn't mention Beatrice as his companion, as he mentions the two other girlfriends of his friends. Um, so we can assume here that he was doing the usual game of using the screen woman or the woman, uh, la donna dello schermo, in not mentioning Beatrice. But what's so funny for us, I think it is funny for people of our sensibilities, is that for himself, he imagines he will have the woman who is the 30th woman in his list of beautiful Florentine women. Because in the scuola, in the Vita Nova, in two places, he mentions having written a poem of 60 uh, verses in which he had mentioned the 60 most beautiful women in Florence. So that's pretty strange for us. And so here he is inviting the 30th. And notice the Beatrice is not even the first one in his list. It was only the ninth. And all of this is, in a sense, something that we surmise from what he says in the Vita Nova, because nobody ever met, um, was able to find this poem. So I thought you'd be um, amused by this. Okay, comes the exile. Uh, these are some verses taken from the uh, Divine Comedy. These are actually, it's a prophecy that one of his ancestors that was in paradise, Cachaguida, makes to Dante, telling him that he will find out how bitter is the bread of another person and how hard it is to go up and down the stairs of somebody else's home. Uh, he lived in exile, uh, I proudly say in Verona. As you can see, that's the statue um, that was devoted, given to Dante. The, uh, it's a statue that was placed in this square, which is called Piazza dei Signori or Piazza Dante, in 1865. So to commemorate once again his birthday, um, the person who sheltered him, one of the uh, persons of the nobleman, nobleman who uh, protected Dante was Can Grande della Scala. You see, uh, a beautiful sculpture. If you were to see this uh, statue by close, you would see the Cangrande de la Scala is actually smiling in this sculpture. And uh, he spent um, from 
1303 to 1304 in Verona with Bartolomeo della Scala and from 1312 to 1318 uh, in Verona with Cangrande. This is my last um, slide and I owe the idea, the idea of these slides to Anna uh, because it, it's uh, Anna was saying, but uh, we still use verses from the Divine Comedy in our conversation, and that's true. These are all expressions that Italian do use, and they are verses from the Divine Comedy, and I have all the sources here in case you want to look at some of them. Uh, I just want to mention that for Galeotto Fu, Il libro e chi, e chi lo scrisse is the beginning of the beautiful story of Francesca da Rimini in the fifth, I think it's fifth, Canto of the Inferno. And it's one of the reading that we will discuss next time and in the book club. But I want to just spend a minute on Non Ragionian di Lorma Guarda e Passa because, again, it's almost humorous. So Non Ragionian di Lorma Guarda e Passa, of course, means let us not talk about them. Just look at them and walk away. Now, this was Virgil telling Dante that he shouldn't talk with the Ignavi, and the Ignavi are the cowards, are the wishy-washy, the people who don't take a position. Now, what happened recently was that a German newspaper, I think yesterday or a few days ago, uh, printed a big, big article by a scholar who said that actually Dante was in a sense achieved and that the Italian had made a big mistake devoting Dante B to Dante because Dante one was a, a revista, so was somebody who used, um, who exploited situation to his advantage. And moreover, he was accused of plagiarism because an Arabian Arab poet and already used this metaphor of the journey to the afterlife. And so Dante was copying this idea. And that might very well be that Dante, you know, got the inspiration from this other poet. But I think I want to conclude with just one point about what these German critics are missing. Italians, I don't know what uh, other Italians among you may say, but Italians are not particularly proud of themselves. They, in my culture, unlike perhaps in American culture, you don't grow up thinking that Italians are the best of the world. The fascists, you know, recall their, the past of Italy to the Roman, and so uh, try to uh, make Italians proud of their past. But Italians are self, in a certain way, self-effacing, many of them. And so the fact that we had a list Dante to be proud of seemed to me uh, something to celebrate. And uh, I'm not sure that I want to follow this German article on saying that our Dante was not worth celebrating. So thank you very much for your attention. And I do hope you have comments or questions. And I know that Tiziana will be excellent in helping us through this. Grazie, grazie, Professore Garavasa, for this great presentation. I, I know there is so much that you would like to share with us. And unfortunately, we only got so much time. So, uh, but again, we will, we will have a chance to, to um, have a deeper look at the Divina Commedia on April 29th, uh, as well as um, in May as well for the, the third event. As, uh, um, as you mentioned, um, we will do kind of a, a book club and, and read together parts of uh, the Divine Comedy. So yes, um, does anyone have a question or a comment or anything they wish to, to share? Feel free to unmute and 
Rana, thank you again. It was wonderful, as usual, a wonderful discussion and really, really interesting. I learned a lot. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, this German writer is claiming that Dante got his ideas from an Arabic poet. Did he have really access to those kinds of writings at the time? I mean, was, was that stuff freely, you know, available? I know he was from a noble background. So I, I, it just seems like that might be a stretch, but I don't know. Right, wondering. right. I like this follow up on that story. I, I just saw it this morning because it just <laughs> came up. La Repubblica, El Corriere de la Sera have articles on this. And I, I just found out today, so I didn't have the time to read the article. I had the same uh, first thought, Laura, but one part of me thinks that maybe Dante did have access. Those years, I mean, <clears throat> if you think in the history of philosophy, you see that the Arab philosopher, Avicenna, Vero, and so on, had access to Aristotle's work. And they actually oh, okay. translated Aristotle. So that made me think that maybe Arabian uh, scholars were um, known in Europe, in the part of Europe where Dante lived. And so it, it's possible that he might have. Of course, I don't know if this Arabian <clears throat> yes. uh, Poet wrote three books of poems. <laughs> I mean, like the, the Divine Comedy is big. And what, what Dante did with it was criticize all the politicians that mm -hmm. had, you know, mm -hmm. done bad things. He, he had a lot of the history in it. I don't know if the work of this Arabian poet was um, comparable. Maybe mm -hmm. he was criticizing his culture. But uh, in any case, I think poets yeah. do this all the time. And yeah. so do musicians. And yeah, they everyone. Do yeah. Right. We love to cite other people's work. So I don't think it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's the whole thing about human civilization, right? <laughs> You're kind of building on people that came before you or were there at the same time. So the other quick question, because I don't want to take up too much of your time, is that in the um, in the Contico from St. Francis, there was the letter K. So yes. there a letter this so there's no K in Italian, right? So Absolutely. but there is in Latin. I don't remember having seen the K. So that, right, I see Monica saying no. I don't think so either. And I did teach Latin at my university. And so I, I haven't forgotten that. Um, I think it, it wasn't part of Latin. I don't know what influence um, uh, Francis to put a, a K right. there. Okay. I, I really this is don't weird. know. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm glad you noticed. It surprised me too. But no, I I never saw enlightening the K. So it must have been a different influence. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And we, we have a question uh, from Monica as well. Monica, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I can ask it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Monica is asking, uh, do we know um, in what other cities um, uh, Dante lived uh, beside Verona or during? Yes, the yes. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, I always want to give as much detail as I can, but I can, but I forget. So he came to Verona. His first shelter is that. Um, <clears throat> Um, square uh, text says, but then he went to Lunigiana. Lunigiana was an area between uh, um, Liguria and Toscana. So it was on the corner 
between the two countries. Um, and then it went, came back to Italy and then he traveled. He might have been to Paris too. So that goes back to Laura's question too. I think he was um, communicating with a lot of people who were scholars at the time. So he might have read the Arab uh, poem. And then he died in Ravenna, actually. And if some of you have traveled to Italy, you know Ravenna has those beautiful Byzantine mosaics. If you haven't gone there, if you ever go back, you should go and see them because they are beautiful. But supposedly Ravenna, have never wanted to give back the remains, Dante's remains to Florence. So he did travel quite a bit. Those are the areas that I know he went to. That's a Monica for the question. Um, and then we have uh, Leandro who's asking, why do we celebrate Dante uh, today? I mean, on this date of March 25th, um, if we don't know when he was born or when he died exactly. No, we do know he died, right? He died, uh, this is the date of his death, right, Tiziana? Am I well, I'm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quite sure about why it is a March twenty fifth. Um, oh, I'm, I'm... the year we are sure, but I think people take that to be his birth. But I don't know. Totally, <laughs> I'm not hundred percent sure. I'm sorry. I was never a very good historian. <laughs> But, so, and uh, and honestly, I don't know why uh, to why it is why March twenty fifth has been chosen as the day to celebrate Dante. I don't know if anyone in the group knows knows. more about it. Right, maybe Anna. She always saves us. Anna, um, it seems. I mean, I'm I'm finding a source, and I I don't know how reliable the source is, but it says that. Uh, uh, it could be the date of the beginning of the, when he started the travel, the, the journey in the Divine Comedy. So the 25th oh, yes. of March uh, of uh, 1300. So that yes, it, seems it to could be, be. It could be. However, I'm also seeing that is uh, it's still controversial. So, but that's one right. of the hypotheses. And so that's why they chose the... 25th of March. Right. So. And I, I discovered doing some of my work too that you can't trust the web, right? Because there were some people who were saying that he died in 1380 or something like that, or th much, much later than when he died. So um, we do need to be careful. But the beginning of the Divine Comedy is. Uh, the day before Easter, if I remember, or the day before the land has something uh, having to do with Easter. And so the date of 25th of March, my fifth there, having to do with Easter. <clears throat> Thank you, Anna. Um, and Bruna is asking, how was Dante affected by the death of Beatrice? Well, in the Vita Nuova, he comments on it because the Vita Nuova, as I said, has poems written during her lifetime, but then the prose passages are all written afterwards. And so I think how it affected was that she became even more the Donna Angelicata or the woman who was going to uh, lead him to a good path. In his biography, the little bit I was able to find, I found out that he actually had a period of his life in which he was um, carrying on, a, I don't want to say dissolute life, but a life that wasn't uh, very good, bad companies, bad habits. And so I think her death and her, his reflection on her death led him to recover. And so the writing of Vita Nuova is 
uh, consider the way in which he uh, reacted to uh, the loss of Beatrice. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we have you. You have answered all the questions, and um, yeah, I want to again. Uh, oh, maybe there is one more. Let me check. Oh, so, there Joseph, is a good suggestion on okay. Echo. Do you want to read it? Yeah, yeah, I was just reading. Umberto Echo has some very fun. This is from Joe de la Cova. I hope I pronounced it correctly, about Dante and his invention of the Italian language in his book on the shoulders of giant. Do you want to share, Joe, what Umberto Eco says, or just mention that? I will certainly read it. Uh, Umberto Eco is such a complex writer, and he, he makes so many sort of deep references uh, I couldn't really do justice to his work, but he does talk about the transition from Latin through the Hesperic tradition uh, and the, the many, many versions of Latin and Dante's ambition to sort of create a better, finer, sort of timeless Italian from those traditions. So uh, yeah. I just rec wanted to recommend people uh, take a look at that uh, essay in his book on the shoulders of giants. Um, Alberto you. Eco is always fun to read because he's just dazzling. Right, right. And you're right. And he was a linguist. I mean, he cared about language a lot. So it was his area of expertise. So although, you know, he was a very uh, in some ways, idiosyncratic scholar. He didn't go with the uh, current. He had his own way of thinking. He might have had a very uh, well-based reason to say what he said. So I think I will look at him. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, why is it called vulgare? Excellent. Uh, oh, this is my son. I shouldn't say excellent question. <laughs> it, it doesn't have a derogatory meaning. Um, it, it's not a derogatory meaning, vulgare, at the time. I think it goes back to Latin. Vulgus meant people. And so vulgare would have been the language of the people. That is my guess, though. I don't have a scholarly answer to that. But that's, and, and that's why Dante corrects that, right? Because he needs the vulgari eloquentia. He says it has to be vulgari illustre. So it has to be the language of the people, but it has to be used by, illustriously, by the literate. Uh, the, the poets, the writers, has to be taken up from the vulgus and recreated as an excellent, illustrious language. So, hello. Thank you. Yes, Marky? Could we equate vulgare with common, the term common? Yes, mm -hmm. I think that would be a good interpretation of the word. We know derogative term, no derogative meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank One you. One other question. There is yes. an organization called the Dante Society. Yes. And Tiziana I've... and Pardon? Anna, they know something. So I, I turned that question to them. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to say? Excellent question. By well, the way, the Dante Alighieri Society gave me a book when I was in um, uh, elementary school, because I was a very good student. I discovered a few short years ago that my grandfather was a member of the Dante Society in starting about 1890. Yes, I believe you. I and believe th you. This was out in California. And in California, there's no records of any of that left. Ah, uh huh. huh. And, uh, California was, well, 
the Italian culture in California was somewhat purged at one point in time. I won't huh. go more deeply into that. But oh, of course. I got the impression, I was thinking, would he have been a member of it as a, as a way to keep his language skills? That could be, right? I, I don't um, know I... Yeah, well, if the, the Società Dante Alighieri was created uh, with the purpose of uh, um, giving language classes to the children of the immigrants of Italian immigrants. That was the reason why they created the Società Dante Alighieri uh, so that uh, the, yeah, in, uh, from South America to US and other places where lots of Italian immigrated could have a place where their children could learn the language. So your explanation is, I mean, I think that that could have been the reason why your father was a member uh, of the Committee of Società in California. Mm -hmm. So um, then it evolved uh, during, I mean, now it's been <laughs> there for a long time. It evolved uh, and uh, it became a, a still a place where people go and learn the language, but also uh, where cultural events are held. And in fact, uh, the Dante D, of course, uh, the Società Dante Alighieri has has been uh, commemorating uh, Dante in many different ways all through the, and will do through the, in the next month. Uh, but originally it was focused to the, on the language, on Italian. Okay, well, you no know, capisco l'italiano, so I need them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, era buon italiano. <laughs> Grazie, Anna. And um, I will take one one last question because um, I, I see that we're going over time, so I don't want to take um, too much time of anyone. Um, how were these poems shared in in his days, in the days of Dante? Right. Uh, were there poetry readings? Do, do you know, Kira? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, first, let me. I, I'll go to that. I just wanted to mention that what Alan says about the Vulgata, the Bible translation, it's also very helpful because that is another way of using the um, the word with the same origin, Vulgus, the people's language. But I believe that they share their poems with other poems. I don't think the, the vulgus, <laughs> the people, had access, unless in very rare cases, to literary text. And that's why the invention of printing, you know, was so crucial to develop democracy. I wonder though, in places like Florence, where there was the merchants and the, the bourgeoisie was growing, maybe there might have been circle spreading or, um, you know, trying to share the knowledge. But I would imagine that Dante shared his poems with the other poets. I doubt that he could share with you know, like we do now, nowadays with a poetry reading. But I could be wrong of this. On historical issues, I'm not that good. <laughs> but uh, I wonder whether the Divine Comedy, for example, circulated. I, I think it probably wasn't because he was talking of so many political figures. He put some popes in Inferno in the hell. So it would have been very, in some ways, very dangerous if his writing was shared widely. I bet it wasn't. So anyway, but it's a good question, Dagny, and I will think about and try to see if I find an answer to that question before the our meeting on the Divine Comedy. It's a, it's a very good Query. Any other right. comments? Okay. Oh, I think this is it. Again, thank you so much for this great presentation and thank you to everyone for, for joining us tonight. I hope you all enjoyed and that you learned a lot of things. 
Um, and, and yes, I hope to see you all back on April 29th when we will discuss the, the Divine Comedy. Um, so thank you again. Buona thank sera you. I enjoyed studying this again. So thank you for being willing to come. Bye-bye. <laughs> Grazie. Grazie mille. Grazie. Grazie mille. Grazie mille.